Okay, here we go. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining the IEEE EMBS webinar series uh, on the frontiers of uh, biomedical imaging and analysis. So my name is uh, Ping Kun Yan. Uh, I'm an associate professor of biomedical engineering at uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. So I'm co-hosting this uh, webinar with uh, doctors uh, Ahmed Kaskin, Marlene uh, DeBruni, Maris Lingraru. We are all part of the uh, HOE BIIP Technical Committee. So today we also have our chair, Professor Xiaoyi Zhang from uh, University of Monster here. Um, so Xiaoyi, yeah, maybe you can say hi to everyone, everybody. So welcome to this web seminar, and uh, we lo look forward to, uh, forward to attendance also in the future. Great, thank you. We also have uh, two uh, panelists here, uh, Professor Ji Wang from uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and also Professor Li Shen from University of uh, Pennsylvania. So I see uh, Professor Shen uh, just joined us. Um, so today, the uh, talk is going to uh, be given by Professor Yu Ping Wang from uh, Tulane University. Uh, professor Wang is currently a professor of uh, biomedical engineering, computer sciences, neurosciences, and biostatistics and data science at the Tulane University. Before that, he took various positions worldwide. Uh, in uh, 2003, he returned to academia as an assistant professor of computer science and electrical engineering at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Dr. Wang's recent effort has been uh, uh, bridging the gap between uh, biomedical imaging and uh, genomics. So we're, uh, he has actually over uh, 300 peer-reviewed publications, <laughs> very impressive number. Dr. Wang is a fellow of AIMBE and has served as uh, numerous program committees and NSF and NIH review panels. So he is currently associate editor for Journal of uh, Neuroscience Methods IEEE ACM transactions on computational biology and bioinformatics, and also the IEEE transactions on medical imaging. So today he will speak about his research on interpretable multimodal deep learning with application to about, uh, brain imaging and genomics data fusion. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let's welcome our speaker. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you uh, for the invitation. Uh, so I'd like to uh, take this opportunity uh, to talk about our uh, research uh, and the interface uh, between uh, uh, multimodal uh, brain imaging and uh, genomics. Uh, in particular, uh, I would like to uh, report on our recent work uh, for using a multimodal deep learning model uh, to address the challenging in uh, the integration of uh, multimodal brain imaging and genomics. Uh, so, uh, so we know uh, the current year is uh, uh, precision medicine or uh, individualized medicine. Uh, so, my understanding is that uh, the precision medicine is largely driven uh, by the integration of uh, multimodal uh, brain imaging and uh, genomics, in particular uh, in uh, neuroscience and uh, uh, brain research area. Uh, so here uh, is an example, you know, to show uh, in a typical, you know, uh, brain research lab, people use a variety of uh, brain imaging modalities, such as uh, MRI, uh, MEG, uh, deficient tensor imaging, uh, to analyze the brain. At the same time, uh, they also collect uh, multi omics data, such as uh, genome sequencing, uh, the DNA, uh, DNA methylation, and the gene expression, uh, so people uh, can understand uh, what's the underlying genomic mechanism uh, regarding the uh, brain uh, changes. Uh, for example, uh, we have our uh, ongoing project uh, to study the uh, brain dynamics using multimodal MRI and uh, uh, MEG uh, in collaboration with uh, three other states, uh, including uh, Julia Stephen uh, from the Mandel Research Network 
uh, Tony Wilson uh, from uh, Nebraska, and uh, my uh, long-term collaborator, Vince Calhoun, uh, who is now uh, at uh, uh, Atlanta. So our goal is to uh, uh, collect uh, about uh, uh, 200 you know, samples uh, from the age 9 to 15. Uh, those uh, uh, subjects uh, are, you know, healthy adolescents. Uh, so because uh, at the adolescent uh, uh, stage, their brain uh, goes through dramatic changes. So we use uh, MRI to get the good spectral resolution. At the same time, we use uh, MEG uh, to uh, get the uh, good uh, temporal resolution about the brain dynamics. We know MEG uh, provide a uh, very high temporal resolution about the brain dynamics, even at the uh, nanosecond level. At the same time, we uh, collect uh, the genomics and the epigenomics uh, to study how the genes and the environmental factors interact with uh, uh, brain uh, endophenotypes and uh, further link with uh, clinical assessments. Uh, so currently, uh, our project has uh, entered the second stage uh, and supported by NIH. Uh, we further extend the age group to be uh, uh, from uh, 5 uh, to 15. Uh, so our goal is to uh, uh, use both uh, MRI and MEG to study the uh, functional connective network with both high spatial and uh, temporal resolu resolution uh, in addition uh, using uh, genomic and uh, epigenomic markers uh, we can extract the uh, the changes of uh, genomics at the uh, SNAP methylation or genomic level. Uh, after this, uh, we can uh, conduct the uh, research on their interactions to study how the genomic variations uh, impact the brain functional connectivity network and uh, link with behaviors and uh, cognitions. Uh, furthermore, we wanted to integrate uh, those, you know, multi-model uh, brain uh, imaging and uh, multi-omics, including their interactions, uh, to make uh, uh, predictions about uh, individuals' uh, behavioral or cognitive changes. Um, so this uh, is really a, a, a multi-disciplinary uh, and multi-set uh, collaboration between uh, four states. Uh, so on one hand, uh, we uh, design novel uh, experimental paradigm to uh, stimulate uh, the brain uh, changes and collect their uh, uh, genomic and uh, brain imaging data. So we perform a uh, uh, pronectum analysis. Here, uh, after this, we perform a uh, linear or nonlinear you know, correlation analysis uh, to find their interactions. Uh, so after that, uh, we uh, build a uh, integration or uh, fusion model to uh, integrate the complementary information from imaging, from uh, genomics, and the interactions uh, both between uh, imaging and uh, genomics and uh, within uh, each uh, omic or imaging level. So at the end, uh, we perform a uh, rigorous uh, validation uh, using uh, both public and uh, 
uh, our own in-course data and uh, uh, collaborate with clinicians and biologists uh, to validate the results and uh, interpret the finding. So this is really a, a, a multidisciplinary uh, research project combining uh, approaches from imaging, from genomics, uh, from data sciences, and uh, combine experimental, you know, uh, research with uh, uh, computational analysis. Uh, I will show uh, some of our uh, results. Uh, um, but uh, there are many uh, uh, computational challenges for analyzing and uh, integrating uh, those multi-model uh, brain imaging and uh, uh, multi-omics data. Uh, first, uh, those data are collected at uh, multiple scales and from multi-modalities and from different uh, uh, labs and uh, sets. Uh, so we have to do uh, uh, data formalization and uh, normalization, and in particular, as a uh, data representation uh, to represent those uh, different types of data. The data, you know, uh, can be uh, continuous. For example, if we measure the uh, uh, blood level, right? So they are uh, continuous. And if we uh, analyze uh, the SNPs, we know they can be uh, discrete. And uh, we can represent using 0, 1, 2 or different uh, SNPs. If we only uh, study uh, disease and health control, we have binary uh, types of data. So how to represent the mixture uh, of those uh, different types of data is a, a significant challenge uh, in data sciences. And uh, finally, uh, we have to consider uh, our model uh, 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 development. So in designing the model, we need to uh, uh, consider whether we should use a linear model or non-linear model. For the linear model, uh, they are uh, easier to uh, interpret, but on the other hand, they cannot uh, uncover the complex relationship between uh, different types of data. Uh, when we perform a uh, correlation analysis, uh, the interaction uh, between uh, two types of data is uh, comparatively uh, easier. But if we extend the data type uh, to be uh, three or more than three, then the multi-way uh, correlation analysis uh, become a big challenge. Uh, so at the end, uh, so we can um, propose a variety of approaches for data integration. Uh, there, you know, uh, we can uh, use uh, conditional, uh, conventional uh, statistical model or more sophisticated uh, uh, deep learning model. And we know the deep learning model is very powerful in uh, revealing the complex interactions uh, between uh, the data types. However, they are uh, uh, difficult to uh, interpret. So we have to uh, consider all those factors uh, in our uh, uh, algorithm uh, design. Um, we know uh, to study the interactions uh, between different types of data, uh, the CCE model is a very popular approach uh, to analyze the interactions between uh, uh, heterogeneous you know, uh, data. Uh, so here I have uh, two data sets, X1 and X2, to represent uh, genomics and uh, uh, brain imaging data. Uh, using CCE, uh, we can uh, project our genomics data and the imaging data into a chronic you know, variants and uh, uh, maximize uh, their uh, uh, projections. So this way, uh, we can uh, detect 
the cross modality interactions or correlations. And uh, we can also uh, perform uh, feature extraction or dimension reduction to identify uh, correlated variables between uh, brain imaging and genomics. Uh, however, uh, the CC model uh, has uh, limitations. Uh, so one uh, limitation is that it cannot uh, uh, identify the complex relationship between uh, the two data types. Uh, to this end, uh, people uh, at the uh, machine learning community uh, propose the difficult CC model. So the idea is that uh, one can represent the genomic data X1 and uh, brain imaging data S2 using a multi-layer uh, deep network. We know uh, using the multi-layer deep network, uh, we can uh, reflect the complex uh, uh, interactions uh, between each individual uh, uh, you know, data points. And uh, we can represent any function uh, F, F1 and uh, F2. Uh, if we uh, only take uh, you know, uh, uh, two layers, the input layer and the output layer, we know the F1 and the F2 uh, can degenerate into uh, the linear model or become the linear you know, CC model. But uh, using multi-layer uh, neural network, uh, we can project the data or represent the data uh, using uh, any complex function. At the output layer, we get uh, uh, Z1 and Z2. Uh, after this, we add another uh, uh, CC uh, layer uh, to find the interactions uh, between uh, two data types or two wheels. Uh, so this is called a deep CCA. Using a uh, deep CCA, uh, we can detect the complicated relationship or interactions between uh, two data types. Um, however, uh, for uh, both uh, linear and deep CCA, uh, they still have limitations. Uh, they are not uh, linked with uh, phenotypical variables uh, Y. And Y can also be uh, uh, regarded as uh, disease labor. For example, for a uh, healthy and uh, uh, cases, we can use a binary uh, value to represent Y. And Y can be continuous uh, to represent uh, phenotypical traits. Uh, so uh, in order to uh, link the genomics and the brain imaging with uh, uh, phenotypical traits Y, uh, we usually use a regression model to fit both uh, genomics and the imaging data, X1 and X2, to the phenotypical variable, Y. Uh, so using correlation analysis like uh, CCA, we can uh, study the interactions between genomics and the imaging. Uh, the idea of hyper-regularized learning is to combine the regression model with uh, correlation model. In other words, uh, we wanted to incorporate the interactions between genomics and imaging as uh, uh, prior knowledge into uh, the regression model. Uh, this way, uh, we can uh, have a better uh, representation of both imaging and genomic data. Uh, and uh, link with uh, phenotypical traits. Uh, so when we uh, uh, 
uh, combine the regression model with a uh, correlation model, uh, we can couple the uh, regression uh, coefficients uh, with the uh, uh, correlation uh, 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 variables. So this end up with the current regular uh, regular uh, regularized learning. Uh, in 2014, uh, the two statisticians uh, at Stanford uh, proposed a collaborative regression, uh, which is a, a type of current regularized learning. Uh, so given uh, two data sets, uh, let's say uh, genomics X1 and the imaging S2, and also uh, the phenotypic or, uh, variable Y. So the idea of collaborative regression uh, is to uh, do the uh, regression and uh, incorporate the correlation between the two data sets at the same time. Uh, if we look at the uh, object function, so the first term is actually the uh, uh, CC uh, uh, formulation uh, to consider the interactions between X1 and X2. And the last two terms, we know uh, they are the data uh, fitting uh, uh, term uh, to fit the genomic data and the imaging data with uh, phenotypic variable Y. So using uh, the collaborative regression, uh, we can uh, incorporate the interactions as a per knowledge into the regression. Uh, so this way, uh, we can perform uh, uh, genomic and imaging feature uh, uh, selection while also uh, uh, incorporate their interactions. So this way, uh, we can uh, um, have a better fit uh, to the phenotypic uh, data Y by considering the interactions between the two data sets. However, for this uh, collaborative uh, regression model, they are still uh, linear. They cannot uh, uh, capture the complex relationship uh, between uh, X1 and X2. So uh, we uh, propose the deep collaborative uh, learning namely uh, the DCR model uh, to uh, overcome the collaborative regression model. So our idea is uh, we first use the multi-layer uh, deep network to represent X1 and X2. So at the output layer, uh, we add a collaborative learning layer. So for the collaborative learning layer, um, on one hand, uh, we wanted to uh, seek the interactions between Z1 and Z2. Uh, so this is like a deep CCA. On the other hand, uh, we, want to, uh, we wanted to link the output of Z1 and Z2 with uh, uh, the phenotypic variable or the class label Y. So this way, uh, we can combine the correlation analysis and the regression model using a, a deep learning framework. The advantage of a DCL model is it is more flexible to detect the complex cross uh, modality interactions. At the same time, we can uh, better fit uh, to the class label Y or uh, phenotypic variable Y. Uh, so we can consider our uh, DCL model is a nonlinear version of the uh, regression, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the collaborative regression model. So mathematically, uh, we can formulate our deep collaborative learning model uh, to be uh, the maximization of 
the following object function. Uh, you can see the first term is to uh, maximize the correlation uh, between uh, the representation of the two data sets, X1 and X2. Um, the last two terms is to uh, uh, minimize the fitting error uh, between the uh, uh, multi-layer neural network representation of the original data and uh, the class label Y. So the first term is a uh, uh, correlation term. The last two terms are the data fidelity term. And uh, we can uh, perform the maximization um, by finding the two uh, 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 neural network representation of the original data, uh, X1 and X2. Uh, so once we find the uh, uh, network representation of X1 and X2, uh, we can uh, um, find the uh, variants U1 and U2 uh, to project the data uh, at another layer. So this is uh, the idea of uh, deep collaborative learning. Uh, to uh, solve this uh, object function, uh, first, uh, you know, we need to uh, uh, find the gradient uh, of this object function. And after this, uh, we can use mini batch stochastic gradient descent to train the network. Combining with uh, backward propagation, uh, we can um, pass the gradient from one layer to the another layer uh, uh, by repeating this procedure, we can uh, well train the network. Now I wanted to uh, uh, discuss how to apply this uh, deep collaborative learning uh, to the brain network analysis. Uh, we know uh, we can uh, use functional uh, MRI or MEG uh, to uh, construct the brain connectivity network. So the brain connectivity network uh, for each individual is uh, also called uh, brain fingerprints. And in recent years uh, have seen uh, significant uh, progress for using uh, brain connectivity network as a uh, fingerprint to make uh, predictions about uh, individuals' behavior and uh, cognitions. Uh, so the first step is to uh, construct the brain connectivity network from the uh, fMRI uh, signals. Uh, so using uh, some prior knowledge, uh, we can divide the brain into different uh, uh, sub-regions or regions of interest, and uh, we can uh, uh, consider each uh, brain region of interest as uh, vertices uh, in the uh, graph. And uh, using the time uh, varying uh, fMRI signals, we can um, uh, link different regions of interest uh, by uh, forming a uh, network or graph. So the uh, network or the graph uh, is defined by a similarity uh, matrix, uh, which uh, is also called a functional connectivity. And uh, for each individual, uh, we can uh, get the functional connectivity uh, from different uh, fMRI tasks or different, uh, you know, modalities. And uh, we know uh, the functional connectivity through false uh, act as a fingerprint uh, that can identify uh, individual 
or group of subjects uh, such as uh, uh, ages, genders, and uh, 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 cognitive uh, behaviors. So they can also uh, 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 be used uh, to make uh, predictions such as uh, uh, below the intelligence, uh, which is a matter of uh, IQ. Uh, so, uh, in your sense, uh, the functional connectivity in, uh, uh, network is uh, well, you know, uh, uh, recognized as a significant uh, biomarker uh, to uh, recognize, uh, you know, individuals or groups. Uh, for example, here is a, a, a interesting study to show uh, the females and the males uh, have a significant difference in their uh, brain connectivity network uh, at the uh, early age from eight to uh, uh, 14. So after 30 age, uh, the difference uh, between their connectivity network uh, uh, become uh, smaller. So we wanted to uh, uh, apply our deep collaborative learning model uh, to understand so what are the difference uh, between different uh, you know population groups. Uh, such as uh, uh, age groups or uh, between different uh, uh, cognitive uh, groups. For example, uh, for uh, adolescents, they have different uh, you know, IQs. So what are, are the uh, underlying difference in the brain connectivity network? Uh, so we perform uh, uh, real data analysis. Uh, so here uh, uh, we uh, test our model using uh, Philadelphia Neural Development of Curve Study, which is a very large uh, skill study uh, to uh, study the brain development. Um, uh, we use nearly 100 uh, uh, subjects from the age eight to uh, 12 years old. And for each subject, um, we collect uh, uh, multi paradigms fMRI or multi-task fMRI, uh, including the resting state fMRI, the memory uh, uh, test fMRI, and emotion uh, test fMRI, and uh, reflect, uh, uh, they reflect uh, the brain activities and the different uh, uh, tasks or different uh, paradigms. Uh, so before uh, we uh, run our model, we perform pre-processing including uh, motion correction, normalization, and uh, smoothing uh, to uh, um, uh, get the uh, pre-processed data. So at, uh, after this, we run our deep collaborative learning model on each combination of uh, multi-task of fMRI, such as the combination of resting state and uh, impact or memory uh, task fMRI. Uh, this way uh, we can see how the combination of multi paradigms or multi task fMRI uh, can help us uh, to distinguish between different uh, uh, population groups or make our predictions about uh, uh, behavior changes. And uh, we know uh, for uh, Deep learning, a big challenge is to uh, train the model uh, based on limited samples. Uh, even for this uh, nearly a thousand uh, subject, uh, uh, they are not enough uh, to train the model. Uh, therefore, uh, we use uh, data augmentation uh, to uh, artificially generate uh, more you know, samples. Uh, to uh, well train our model. So data augmentation uh, is a very popular approach uh, in uh, machine learning, uh, which uh, can uh, transform the image data, such as 
uh, rotation, reflection, and scaling uh, to uh, get uh, more data samples. Uh, so we uh, generate you know, more samples by using uh, data augmentation and uh, uh, re-sample the data in the temporal space. Uh, Here is a result. Uh, so uh, these uh, three figures uh, show the classification of uh, two AG groups using the combination of uh, two different uh, FMI uh, tasks. Uh, here uh, we divide our AG group into uh, pre teenagers and young adults. Uh, for pre teenagers, uh, their age is from 8 to 12 years, uh, 11 years. And for young adults, uh, their age is from uh, 18 to uh, 22 years. Uh, so we want to see whether we can use uh, the combined uh, FMI tasks to distinguish the two age groups. Uh, based on their uh, brain functional connectivity networks. And uh, you can uh, tell from the figure uh, using the deep collaborative learning model that we develop, uh, we can get uh, uh, up to 95% uh, of the accuracy. Uh, as a comparison, uh, we also uh, uh, pick uh, 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 five other uh, representative uh, models, such as uh, uh, CC models, uh, kernel CC model, which is a nonlinear uh, CC model, and a deep CC model, and a logistic regression and a collaborative regression model. And you can see the deep collaborative learning model deliver the highest accuracy among all uh the five models that we uh compared against so we get a consistent result uh using uh the combination of uh resin state and emotion uh task fmi and the combination of uh impact and uh, emotion uh, fmi Uh, we also uh, uh, apply the deep collaborative learning model uh, to classify uh, the two groups of different IQs. And uh, here we use a uh, WRT score or wide range achievement testing score uh, to uh, quantify the IQs. We still uh, get a very uh, High accuracy, uh, which is nearly uh, uh, eighty-five uh, percent of accuracy, when recognizing the low IQ and the high IQ group. Um, in order to uh, visualize the difference of representing the uh, Brain connectivity network using uh, different models. Uh, so uh, we use uh, 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 Chisney to uh, project the data uh, from high dimension to low dimensions. Uh, here you can see uh, the difference of representing the uh, brain connectivity network data using uh, different models. So using our uh, deep collaborative learning model. Uh, you can see uh, we can well separate the young adults and the children. But using a CC model, kernel CC and a deep CC model, uh, they cannot, you know, uh, well, you know, separate uh, these two types of data because uh, the CC models are designed to uh, study the interactions of uh, two data types, but not good for uh, 
uh, representing uh, the two data types, and they cannot uh, form a cluster in the uh, representing a uh, space. And uh, using logistic regression and uh, collaborative regression, uh, they are a little bit better, but uh, uh, still uh, worse than the deep collaborative learning model. So we can consider the deep uh, collaborative learning model is a better way to represent uh, the high dimensional uh, multi model heterogeneous you know, data types. Um, so our story is not uh, over. Uh, and uh, we know uh, uh, in brain research, we're not uh, uh, concerned about the high accuracy uh, in the prediction or classification. We are also interested in the underlying mechanism that uh, causes the difference uh, between different uh, uh, groups. But uh, deep learning uh, is a black box. Uh, it's not possible uh, to provide a p-value uh, for uh, uh, identifying the significant, uh, you know, uh, green uh, regions. And how to interpret uh, the results and how to uh, uh, interpret the underlying biological uh, mechanism. So we have to uh, consider, consider uh, the interpretability of the deep learning model. And for this uh, particular uh, deep collaborative learning model we uh, proposed, uh, we simply use the inclusion sensitivity analysis. So the idea is uh, we can uh, manually remove a particular uh, functional connectivity, uh, fun functional network, and uh, see uh, if the accuracy uh, will drop after uh, removing uh, a particular uh, functional network, like a sensor motor network. Uh, if we include uh, all those uh, 11 uh, functional connectivity network or no uh, block of those uh, uh, cyber networks, we can get, uh, you know, best accuracy at 95%. Uh, but uh, if we remove our particular cyber, uh, cyber network, like a uh, center uh, motor network, the accuracy will drop to 65%. So that means the central motor network is a significant network that we cannot uh, uh, remove. So in other words, uh, there are the important uh, features that contribute to the classification of different uh, groups or contribute to better prediction of actives. So using the inclusion sensitivity analysis, uh, we identify uh, 11 uh, significant uh, functional networks, including uh, sensor uh, motor network, uh, visual networks, and uh, others uh, which are considered to be uh, important network uh, deserving uh, further uh, you know, studies. So this is one way of interpreting the uh, deep collaborative learning uh, model. Uh, so the details of this work uh, was reported in uh, this paper. So this study was conducted by a former uh, PhD student. Uh, recently, uh, uh, we extend this model uh, to be uh, Reading the CAM guided convolutional uh, collaborative learning. Because using a deep uh, collaborative learning model, we can only uh, detect the significant uh, brain connectivity network at the brain region level, but not at the uh, voxel level. 
and we know uh, the convolutional neural network uh, has a better way to uh, interpret uh, the features uh, using a uh, uh, gradient cam. So therefore, uh, we uh, use convolutional neural network instead of uh, multi-layer uh, neural network uh, to do the analysis. So our idea is uh, to uh, project the genomic SNPs and the brain functional connectivity network uh, using one-dimensional convolutional network and uh, two-dimensional uh, convolutional uh, neural ne network. So at the output, uh, we link the genomic uh, data representation and uh, uh, functional brain uh, network representation using a collaborative layer. Uh, in addition, uh, we add the another uh, 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 block, a model, a module such as a gradient cam to interpret the feature map for both uh, genomic uh, features and uh, image features. So this way uh, we can uh, well integrate uh, the genomics with the brain connectivity network while also uh, can uh, interpret or select the significant uh, 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 genomic uh, biomarkers and uh, uh, brain connectivity regions. And uh, those features identified are also uh, class uh, specific. For example, uh, we can tell what's the difference between a healthy brain and a, a, a diseased brain. Uh, so this is a, a, a you know a novel way uh, to uh, interpret both the genomic and the imaging uh, features, and uh, we can use uh, uh, cam or gradient cam uh, to uh, facilitate the biological uh, mechanism analysis. Uh, so in order to uh, fuse uh, these two uh, convolutional neural network, uh, we uh, propose the following uh, loss function. Uh, if you uh, look at the uh, two class uh, scenario, so the first you know, term is actually the fitting of the neural network uh, output H1 and H2 uh, with the class label Y. Uh, here, the H1 and H2 are the outputs of the uh, two convolutional you know, uh, neural network. And Y is a, a class label, uh, which can be uh, uh, continuous. And the last term is uh, uh, the consideration of interactions between the two outputs, uh, H1 and H2. And we can uh, easily extend uh, this model uh, to uh, multiple classes. So the detail uh, uh, of this model uh, is reported uh, in a recent paper. Uh, so the uh, key uh, to uh, this model is uh, to have a better uh, interpretability. And we know uh, for a CCN model, uh, there are a lot of uh, factors that can impact uh, the interpretation of the final uh, results. Uh, for example, uh, the uh, selection of the convolution uh, filter, uh, the activation um, 
of uh, functions and even the uh, normalization of procedure can all impact the result of the CNN model. Uh, how to interpret the CNN models? Uh, so in the past, uh, people use uh, feature maps. So the uh, idea of the feature map is uh, to uh, uh, find the, uh, the set of weights to combine uh, the feature map produced by uh, the convolutional uh, output uh, at the different uh, layers. And uh, some methods, uh, for example, the uh, CAM or class activity map uh, can calculate the weights by retaining the deep network uh, and uh, add an additional uh, classification layer uh, after the uh, feature map layer. But the uh, CAM approach is not end to end and uh, it needs uh, extra training. And uh, because uh, the addition of uh, the uh, classification layer, and very often uh, we have to uh, retrain the network uh, because uh, after the uh, break of the original uh, architecture. Then uh, the uh, the gradient cam uh, is uh, uh, proposed. So the gradient cam uh, is a class specific uh, approach uh, which you can uh, interpret the feature map at a, a high resolution. So the idea of the uh, gradient cam uh, is to uh, calculate the width, the G, uh, for each uh, class uh, C uh, by uh, taking the gradient of the uh, prediction score Y with respect to uh, the feature map uh, F. Here, uh, YC represents the prediction uh, score for each class uh, C. And uh, FK represents uh, the uh, case feature map. So we can take the gradient and perform uh, uh, average uh, uh, polling to calculate the width G. And uh, then we can uh, um, uh, calculate the feature map by uh, taking the weighted combination of the feature map using the calculated weights uh, G followed by up sampling. So this way uh, we can uh, 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 get the uh, feature map at the high resolution and uh, uh, combined with uh, back propagation, uh, we can uh, uh, map the feature map uh, from the uh, output layer to the uh, input layer. Uh, so we further uh, uh, modify the gradient cam uh, by considering the uh, specific uh, uh, brain network uh, representation uh, uh, interpretation. Uh, so from the um, feature map, we take the gradient uh, but uh, we discard the negative uh, gradient, only uh, retain the positive grind, uh, gradient. And using back propagation, uh, we can uh, track the feature map at the input layer. So this way, uh, 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 we can uh, get the uh, feature map at the voxel level. Uh, again, let's look at uh, our model. Uh, so we use a gradient cam or getting the gradient uh, cam 
uh, to uh, uh, get the uh, important you know feature map and for genomics there are significant you know uh, sleeps and for uh, uh, brain connectivity network uh, there are important uh, uh, connectivity uh, uh, network re uh, reflecting the interactions between different uh, brain regions uh, again let's look at the uh, application so we uh, still apply to uh, the large uh, uh, Philadelphia neural development and cohort study. Uh, so before uh, pre process, uh, before the analysis, and uh, we use uh, priori biological uh, you know data sets such as uh, brain tissue specific uh, database uh, to do uh, uh, some pre processing, and uh, similarly uh, for brain uh, connectivity network, uh, we use. Uh, Brain translation uh, to focus on 20, uh, 264 significant uh, brain region of interest. Uh, then uh, uh, we use this method uh, to uh, uh, make a prediction of uh, low IQ group and uh, high IQ group uh, measured with uh, WRT score. So uh, using uh, the newly uh, proposed uh, uh, CCR model combined with uh, gradient CAM, uh, we get uh, uh, the highest accuracy uh, when compared with uh, other uh, uh, machine learning approaches, including uh, decision tree, random forest, uh, in addition, uh, we are able to uh, distinguish uh, between the low IQ group and the high IQ group and uh, see how they are underlying uh, brain connectivity network uh, differs. So here you can see uh, for low IQ group and high IQ group, there are brain connectivity network are uh, significantly uh, different. So the upper figure uh, is a map uh, generated using a uh, gradient cam. The lower one uh, is uh, the map generated using our uh, gradient guided uh, gradient cam. Uh, so using the uh, uh, interpretable uh, uh, deep learning model, uh, we were uh, able to uh, uh, identify the difference of functional connectivity network between the low, low IQ group and high IQ group. Uh, in particular, we found uh, uh, three uh, harbor region of interest which are responsible for uh, visual uh, processing, object recognition, and uh, word uh, uh, processing. So these are uh, significant uh, biological uh, findings that can be uh, further uh, verified from the uh, current uh, neuroscience uh, study showing the low and high IQ group have a significant difference in their uh, uh, functional networks. And we also uh, uh, found the difference of the genomic uh, SNPs in the two uh, uh, IQ groups. And uh, we perform uh, gene enrichment, uh, enrichment analysis uh, to check uh, the corresponding uh, genomic pathways that are associated with uh, the two uh, groups. And uh, we were able to uh, identify uh, the important genes that uh, uh, can underline the difference between uh, the two uh, cognitive groups. Uh, so the work of this uh, uh, study uh, was reported 
by our uh, recent uh, uh, employee uh, medical imaging uh, paper. And uh, so the study was uh, done by my former uh, PhD student, uh, who is now working at uh, 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 Belgium. Uh, in summary, the integration of uh, multi skill and multi model uh, uh, imaging and genomics uh, brings significant challenges uh, for uh, data uh, analysis and uh, multi view uh, deep learning. Uh, provide a, a powerful approach for heterogeneous uh, data fusion. And finally, uh, the interoperability uh, of uh, the multi-view uh, deep learning uh, is a significant uh, challenge. Uh, so I wanted to highlight uh, in uh, this area uh, the importance of uh, using uh, multidisciplinary uh, approaches uh, so through the uh, uh, you know last decade, so my group has been uh, working with uh, uh, applied mathematician, uh, computer scientists to uh, uh, develop and uh, uh, test a variety of uh, multi-model uh, machine learning models, uh, which are linear and uh, uh, non-linear uh, models. At the end. Uh, we do uh, uh, cross validation using uh, both public and uh, in house data sets. And in particular, uh, we wanted to uh, translate it into uh, uh, biomedical uh, applications uh, in collaborating with uh, uh, clinician and uh, uh, biologist. Uh, so, these are our uh, 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 group of members. So I was fortunate to work with uh, uh, students and postdocs uh, from different you know, backgrounds uh, when conducting uh, this uh, research. And uh, many of the uh, uh, algorithms and the codes are currently uh, publicly available. For example, we develop a variety of uh, CC models uh, you can uh, get from a website and uh, test on your own you know, data sets. And uh, we welcome any form of uh, collaboration. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you, Yuping, uh, for the wonderful talk. That's uh, a lot of uh, very impressive work. Thank you so much. Um, now we can uh, uh, have a few minutes for a um, uh, couple of questions. So uh, Lee told me uh, he has another meeting at 10, so he had to leave. Um, yeah. Otherwise, I actually love to uh, uh, see what uh, he uh, uh, comments. But uh, anyway, um, we can uh, open the um, floor to the audience. While we, we're waiting for the questions, uh, just let the audience know you can either um, raise your hand. I'm going to uh, enable you to talk, or you can just tap the, into the Q&A uh, panel there. So I have, uh, oh, I see the uh, professor one has a question. So go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. All right. So uh, my question is that, uh, um, so in the study, you basically um, uh, identified a correlation between the uh, genomics data and the imaging data. And then uh, you also do the regression, uh, the collaborative uh, uh, learning kind of approach. So the, this data, as you mentioned in the very beginning of the talk, they are very different, like uh, the concrete number uh, sequence versus the image in the special uh, information, et cetera. Uh, for the genomics data, so you also applied a CNN there. Uh, what kind of represent, representation, data representation do you have? And how well the uh, CNN may handle those kind of uh, typically uh, like uh, um, discrete data. Uh, okay, yeah. So, uh, for the you know uh, genomic SNPs, uh, so they are uh, you know discrete you know data. So we shall use you know zero one to to represent uh, different types of uh, SNPs. Uh, so after a number of pre-processing, for example, we use a uh, brain tissue uh, uh, you know database or gene text database. To pick the uh, SNPs, and then we uh, uh, form uh, the you know the long you know SNPs, 
uh, which he, uh, is about, you know, uh, half a million, you know, <laughs> uh, long into a one dimensional vector. So then uh, we use a uh, one dimensional theory model uh, to represent the, you know, the slips. So, so at the same time, we generate a, a feature map. Okay, so the SNPs are represented in in, in uh, uh, zero, one, two for each one, and then you put like a half million of them together to be a very long vector. Yes. Okay. Okay. I see. All right. Um. So another question that uh, you you mentioned the data augmentation here. Yeah, we also do a quite some uh, data augmentation for images. Uh. But do you also do the data augmentation for SNPs? Um. How do you um make sure that uh, those uh, augmented the SNPs are kind of uh, uh, biologically meaningful? Oh uh, yeah, that's a good question. So, uh, uh, for this work, right, we use a, a convolutional neural network. Uh, we didn't uh, perform uh, data augmentation, uh, but uh, um, for this, you know, deep collaborative learning model, uh, we performed uh, uh, data augmentation. However, uh, uh, for this uh, model, deep collaborative learning model. Uh, it's hard uh, to do uh, uh, data augmentation for genomics data. So we didn't do uh, uh, data augmentation, or we didn't uh, test uh, the genomic data yet for the uh, deep uh, uh, collaborative learning model. Okay, I see, thank you. So yeah. Professor Wang. Uh, yeah, excellent work. I think the essential idea of collaborative learning is uh, very interesting. And uh, my understanding, with collaborative learning and the objective function, you try to uh, make sure you use common features in both X1 domain and X2 domain. I guess there could be a possibility there are some unique features in X1 domain and some other unique features in X2 domain. They also help you predict Y very well. And your objective function doesn't give a emphasize to those unique features. Is my understanding correct? Uh, yes, yeah, that's a good uh, comment. Uh, so we actually uh, consider uh, generalizing this model uh, using the idea of uh, contrast learning. Uh, so for the CC, uh, CCA model, uh, for example, we uh, propose the model uh, we call it as class specific CCA. So using class uh, specific CCA, uh, we can uh, find the shared or common correlation between imaging and genomics mm. for different uh, uh, classes. Uh, at the same time, we can also identify class specific correlation between imaging and genomics. So we can uh, definitely uh, uh, modi uh, uh, modify the object function uh, to consider, you know, the class specific uh, uh, difference between uh, different types of data. Uh, so Yuping, what's your feeling? You think the uh, common features are more important or you think there could be a small chance some unique feature more important in prediction? Uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, the class specific uh, features are more important mm. uh, because okay. those are the, you know, the, uh, the features that can be used to uh, uh, distinguish between different uh, classes. Uh, so in another model, uh, uh, let me see if I can uh, get another slide. Uh, so we do, you know, consider uh, such a, you know, a, a difference. And we use them, you know, to uh, classify uh, different, uh, you know, cancer uh, types here. Uh, for example, this is, uh, you know, the joint CC model or class specific, uh, uh, classific, uh, uh, specific model. Uh, so here I show uh, three classes. What we want we to we can, the cat can be any classes. So uh, they uh, share the common uh, correlations between uh, uh, genomic and uh, imaging data, which I show using uh, uh, 
uh, blue color, right? Mm. But uh, for each class, I should, you know, uh, uh, they may also have uh, specific uh, uh, correlations between genomic and imaging. Uh, mm. Here I draw using uh, red, yellow, and uh, uh, green color. So this uh, specific uh, uh, correlations can be used to uh, defer different types of cancers. We had another paper uh, to show uh, how important the class uh, specific uh, you know, features between genomic and imaging uh, can be used to uh, uh, do a better work in uh, distinguish uh, between different classes. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Yiping. Uh, thank there, you. Yeah, there are uh, two uh, questions in the chat window. The first one uh, is just about the slides. So we are actually uh, recording the session uh, soon, um, just uh, like uh, maybe t tomorrow, uh, once the link is available, the uh, recorded video is going to appear on the um, uh, BIP um, webinar website. So you can go there. For the papers, I think uh, Professor Wang shared the, the link to uh, his homepage. All the papers should be there. Uh, maybe we can just quickly answer that, that uh, uh, question posted by uh, uh, Nahamed. Uh, can you use 1D uh, gradient cam for uh, physiology, uh, physiological time series like EMG, ECG, or 2D spectral com uh, conversion to do interpretability? Uh, yeah, I think that's a, a good question. Uh, it, it can be definitely uh, used to uh, uh, interpret, you know, uh, other, you know, uh, types of data. Uh, and uh, for the, you know, uh, the gradient cam, uh, you know, the cam uh, work for uh, uh, both, you know, 1D and 2D, uh, uh, you know, data. And uh, for uh, time uh, series, you know, data, uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, there might be a, a way, you know, uh, to do it, but uh, I have no idea uh, at this time. Uh, uh, you know, there are some good approaches like, uh, you know, uh, time varying, uh, you know, graphic lasso, you know, which can also be used to do uh, feature selections. And uh, uh, in the deep learning, uh, you know, framework, uh, uh, I think uh, these are uh, further study uh, to extend the uh, gradient camp uh, to the uh, time series, you know, data sets. Sounds great. Yeah, thank you so much, Yuping, uh, for the wonderful talk. So that actually we can uh, uh, conclude the uh, uh, talk today. Thank you all for attending. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. Yeah, you can right. keep in touch. Yeah, okay, thank, thank you. you.